Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I'm super excited to have a repeat guest here today, the Betty Rocker, uh, Bree. And we are going to dive into some of your questions and some of the things that we've both heard in our businesses and practices about body image. And especially when you're struggling as it relates to mold or chronic illness and you feel stuck. And we're going to address all those things and more and hopefully give you some really practical tips on how to overcome, how to have your best self how to have the body image you want, but also accept yourself in the meantime, if you're not quite where you want to be. I know how frustrating that can be. And I know we both have our own experiences of with mold and some of these things that we're like, this is not how I want to be. And yet we're stuck in the midst of that. And we will um, give you all kinds of tips and tricks. So let me actually formally introduce Brie. Um, Brie, known as Betty Rocker, is an internationally known health and fitness coach, innovated, um, innovative entrepreneur and motivator of self-growth. Um, I love she brings her personal experience and just such a realness to her audience. And if you've known her or followed her, um, you have seen this in real life. And of course, your precious pup. We always love seeing him. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like mine too, mine too. Over 3 million people have taken her free 30-day makeover, um, sorry, Make Fat Cry home workout challenge and hundreds of thousands more enjoy success in her online home workout studio, Rock Your Life with her nutrition and fitness programs and challenges. Um, there is so much you have to offer. And if you're not following her, go over to Instagram, um, go to her website um, and be sure and do that. So welcome. Welcome, Brie. Glad to have you back today. Great to see you, Jill. Thanks for yeah. having me. Such it's always treat. fun. It is. It's such a treat because we can talk on so many levels. I, I want to start by kind of, um, we talked about how functional medicine and fitness can transform your body image. And let's speak to those. I know you have a lot of clients and people as well that they may know either they've been in a healthy spot in the past, or they know where they want to get. They're maybe highly motivated. They are good at following plans and keeping the skills, but they're stuck in this physical body that doesn't feel like themselves. They're maybe just a few pounds heavier than they like, or maybe they're a little less strong because they've just been through, or maybe they're post-pregnancy or something where their body's changed and they're like, Ugh, I don't like this. Um, how do we, first of all, mentally deal with that? And then let's talk about how can we get someone to the next level? Because we've all experienced that where we're frustrated and yet we want to love ourselves. So how do we do that, Brie? I really love this sort of, the fact our friendship really speaks to the fact that fitness and functional medicine are a really great complement to each other and that they're both really important pieces of your holistic health journey as a woman or a man, if you yeah, happen to be watching, yeah. or have a man you love, I generally serve women, but, and through them hope to influence their partners, their kids, all of the people around them. Uh, when, when it comes to what you were just asking about, I, I like to look at the fact that life is seasonal, cyclical, and our lives too are seasonal. We go through different seasons in life. And I think having an expectation that we're always going to be the same, either in appearance or body weight or body fat percentage is just really unrealistic because there is this beautiful journey that the earth goes through throughout the life cycle that it has throughout the different seasons, just as we do. And looking to find the beauty within each of these seasons that we go through, even the unexpected ones is a really important part of our human experience, in my opinion. And that was something that when I was younger, I didn't really have the perspective yet to understand, you know, when we're young, we just want to everything to be easy because we're learning. We're constantly taking so much information in. And then as we gain some wisdom and experience, we start to want to hold on to what yes. we perceive that we have lost, but it's not a loss at all. And once we gain a little bit more knowledge and wisdom, we realize that there is so much beauty to be found in each of these different stages of life. And different people go through different seasons. For instance, I haven't had kids myself, and yet so many of the women I serve have. I've gone through other seasons, other things that have set me into a place of maybe inflamed body or gained body fat or lost muscular strength. Since I know a lot of people, that is one of the aspects of our holistic health is to have a physically strong, capable body that doesn't carry a lot of inflammatory burden. Um, but of course, our body is well-equipped yeah. to handle an inflammatory load. And it's also well-equipped to regain strength after we've lost it. So I think the sort of approach of all or nothing and constantly wanting to be like we were in high school, people looking back at a weight that they got used to mm -hmm. seeing when they were 18 years old, when their body wasn't even fully formed before they'd had children before, you know, as women, our hormones go through many different stages in our lives. And 
you know, as a functional practitioner who treats people throughout the course of their life cycle, you see this all the time, but I think probably just like me, the, one of the harder things to help coach people around, even when you're showing them all of their health markers on a lab chart is the mindset with which they approach this, because we know that that the way that we feel towards ourselves and talk to ourselves yes. internally makes a big difference in how quickly we heal or how quickly we go through these, these seasons that we may find more challenging. So I wondered if you'd speak a little bit to that because I think I that's so interesting. I love what you're saying, Brie. And this is so critical because um, again, I, I'll just speak personally. When I was in the midst of mold, I was uh, probably 10 pounds heavier than I normally was prior to that. And it was all inflammation. And there's this like frustration if you're someone who can eat right and exercise and do those things and your body shape changes, but then all of a sudden you get a mold exposure or you get inflammation or you get ill with an autoimmune disease or post COVID there's people who can't exercise now. Let's talk about that too in a few minutes, because all of a sudden these changes happen. And if you're like the old me, the old version of myself was this driven hard driver. And I was so hard on myself, right? Like I was so mean to myself and so frustrated at myself for not, I remember, I'm just going to tell you a funny little story. I don't know if I've ever shared this publicly, but when I used to play piano when I was a kid and I wanted to be perfect, right? Like I was like 10 year old, nine or 10 years old. And I wanted to play all their notes, right? And if I couldn't get it just right, I would literally bite my fingers, like bite them till they hurt because I was so mad. Like, come on fingers. Can't you, makes me want to cry now for that little girl. <laughs> like I, I like that frustration at myself for not being perfect. Like, oh, it makes me want to cry because that, how many people listen out there? Yeah. yeah, that pressure that was put on you that yeah. you absorbed and then yeah. you later carried forward into your yeah. young womanhood life of like, I have to be perfect with, right. you know, you, we just absorb those messages. Yes, yes. So damaging and, and. And that's what, what I want to speak to. If you're listening out there, if you have that mindset and you've like, you're frustrated with, because you've gone through again, post-pregnancy, post-COVID, you can't work out. Maybe you are suffering with autoimmune disease or joint pain or something new, or you go through mold illness, which many of our listeners have gone through. And that really wreaks havoc on the hormones, or you go through menopause or all of these things cause changes. And some of them cause inflammation and you can be doing all the right things and still be feeling stuck. So I love this concept and I love encouraging because I had to really learn to love myself and to love myself no matter what my appearance. And Bree, let's talk to you about the messages we get. I love that you're a stream on Instagram, on social media, that is not the norm, but the norm out there is filter yourself, be perfect. How do we combat the image that, is, that we see and the, the false sense of this, this, um, this not even reality? How do we deal with that? How do our listeners deal with that? Something that's been sticking in my mind since you shared the piano example with me is that when you have a piece of music that you're trying to play, we can define what perfection is when you can play all of the notes perfectly in the piece, correct? Yeah. And if you were to reinterpret the notes in your own way, you would create something new. You might play them in a slower tempo. You might add some different notes or a different melody. Uh, and that's not perfect, actually, to the to the form yeah, of the yeah. original piece. <clears throat> and yet your version is also valid and interesting and beautiful in itself. And I think that what we've missed sometimes is the big picture perspective that our tiny little microcosm of the world that puts women and, and men yes. up to yes. this box of how, what perf, what defines perfection is, is a false narrative in the first place. And that we too often base our entire lives around what I believe is a false narrative that, um, sure, it might be an interesting narrative that can serve us in some ways. Sure. Like, uh, a leaner body may be a sign of good health, but it's not always correct. correct? We yeah. know this from, yeah. from medicine. So, and, and just like someone who appears to have everything going for them may have mental health issues or God, let's hope they don't, but you know, yeah. like yeah. you never know what's really going on inside of this perfect image of a person. So I believe this picture, perfect narrative, this picture, perfect script, this picture, perfect um, sonnet of music. These are all you know, they're just a narrative. They don't have to be your narrative. I say false narrative when it comes to the beauty image ideal, because I think it's very damaging on so many levels. But if we step back from it and take that bigger picture perspective and accept that life goes through seasons, mm -hmm. that we go through seasons, that that narrative is just simply on offer to us and that we can interpret it in any way that we choose. If we have the capacity, which we do to yeah. see the beauty in all the things around us that, that we have. And I think that may be 
um, a spiritual practice in many ways to think about how can I look for the good every day? We talk about how can I be grateful every day? How can I thank my body for what it's capable of doing? Yeah. Even when we're in the midst of maybe sickness or illness, um, I talk a lot, like people will come to me and say, well, I injured my wrist. What workouts can I do yeah. like without my wrist? Or I'm, I had COVID and I, yeah. I really want to exercise. And I say, you know, your body is trying to heal it's got this amazing capacity to heal. So what you want to think about is how can you become an ally with that mm -hmm. process rather than fighting against it? Because when you're trying to push yourself to exercise too quickly, when your body's already got a break or it's under attack from, from a disease or virus, you don't want to be going hard with exercise. Exercise creates a type of stress in your yeah. system. It's a healthy stress when we are healthy, but it can undermine your ability to actually heal yourself if you're doing too much exercise or not resting. So I say, focus on nutrition, focus on supporting your cellular uh, growth and healing and repair with healthy, low glycemic index, low inflammatory foods, focus on getting as much sleep as possible because of the repair processes, the cytokines that are released for your immune system. When you sleep, focus on lowering your stress, focus on being grateful for what you are capable of, what your body is doing for you in that moment. And, and be patient. You know, we can't, because we can't see like what's happening beneath the skin. We often get so impatient with these processes and yet the body's working as hard as it can. And you're just going to undermine its process. If you don't respect it and support it, it's going to go as fast as it can when you give it the support that you mm. can give it and love it along the way. I love that because what you're also bringing um, light to is the fact that often that inflammation, that extra water weight or things that we feel if we're sick or post COVID or post mold or any of these things that many of you who are listening have dealt with, um, it's our body doing the best that it can to help us repair. It's actually protecting us. I always say dilution is the solution to pollution, which means when we are really toxic and sick, we will actually hold on to fat to protect us because it dilutes the toxic load. And it's so frustrating, but it's actually our body doing the best, most loving thing that it can do for us to help us through that process. So I love that because again, I've been through mold and it was like, what is going on with this body of mine? And yet I look back and like, it was so protective and so good for me at that time, right? Even it's bloating, hard. even like yeah. stomach yep. bloating, yeah. like dilution, yeah. like what you said, yes. can you say that again? Dilution, dilution is a solution to pollution. Correct. Yeah. So when you've eaten something that irritates your gut, for mm -hmm. example, your body will retain water as yeah. it works to process that through. Yeah. And people are like, why am I so bloated? Oh, I need to like do more sit-ups. I need to do, yeah. and you're just beating your body yes. up when yes. really we want to take a little bit closer of a look at the root cause of what could yeah. be creating the bloating. And if you're if you know what's causing it and you're willing to take that consequence on, like say yeah. it's a special occasion and you're just aware, maybe you take some digestive enzymes and, yeah. and, and waiting, you know, knowing that's going to happen. Maybe you drink a little more water to help support the flushing through of your system of that stuff. But I just, I really like that, that phrase that you use. And, um, you know, we're just so obsessed with being so yeah. small and so thin and so skinny and, those things aren't necessarily serving us. And, yeah. uh, and as I, you I, and I know, you can have a really low percent body, body fat and actually be way less healthy than someone who's a little bit higher like body fat. Earlier. because mm -hmm, yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think uh, really to me, it like really comes down to body composition, your lifestyle, yeah. your goals. There are a myriad of factors that contribute to what each individual one of us is going to feel their most healthy because it's not just like there's mental health is in the mm -hmm. mix as well. Emotional yes, health, yes. uh, spiritual health and well-being, Absolutely. um, all of these different sort of pieces that are layered together that we have to take into consideration at an individual level. And, um, I focus a lot on strength in mm -hmm. my programs because I feel that when you do start to train for strength or, uh, eat for strength or do the stress management and sleep yeah. to support your strength goals. It really like takes away that focus on how much fat can I lose? And it's yeah. fat loss is a major by byproduct yes. of strength building without becoming bulky. The, the way you get bulky is actually adding more body fat and yeah. uh, strength actually leans us out and it has such protective benefits. So again, just because we're leaner doesn't mean we're healthier. But when you are focusing on building strength for your body, uh, a lot of the times you're focused on balancing your training, mm -hmm. you're focused on resistance mm -hmm. training, yep. whether it's 
body weight training or using weighted objects um, and doing plyometric like explosive mm-hmm. exercises to load the joints and create that healthy cardiovascular system as well. And I, I just feel like that strength focus just kind of like takes us to another place mentally as well, yeah. where we start to think about, oh, longevity. Yes. How can I keep this special body that I love healthy and strong over time so that I can keep doing activities I enjoy in my later years, you know, in the golden years when I want to play with my grandkids or I want yeah. to be hiking with my partner. And those are important aspects of health that I think you know, what, what's, I love that, that saying youth is wasted on the young, <laughs> you know, it's not, we, we no. have a lot of people experiences at that time, but we don't have the perspective yet to figure mm-hmm. out what we need. So. Okay. So I love this. Let's go get specific. Cause this is a probably majority of our listeners could be, you may not fit this category say 35 to 55. A lot of the sure. listeners are this age and they're either perimenopause or just a little bit before, or just a little bit after. And then some of them have, again, if they're listening to you or I, they might've gone through autoimmunity or mold, or even again, we talked about COVID. Sometimes people are having fatigue for months afterwards and having exercise intolerance. So maybe before they were running a few miles, you know, several times a week, or they were doing more high intensity or doing CrossFit. And all of a sudden they're finding themselves not being able to do that same thing. I loved what you said. Let's get specific because I know my own personal experience with mold and actually pretty recently, I could not do the cardio stuff I was used to, but what I kept doing was sit-ups and push-ups and strength training and those little things. And even in my most weakened state, I could do a little bit. What would you suggest of someone who's struggling again with maybe just post mold, maybe just post COVID, maybe post um, or, or hormonally, the things are shifting and they feel like they can't do what they used to do as far as cardio, but they want to stay strong. Would that be how many days a week, some practical tips for that kind of person? Yeah, I think, uh, again, this is going to vary person to person and be a little individual mm-hmm. specific. But with the caveat that each of us can listen to our own body as we go and then just determine if the advice I'm giving you is going to be appropriate for you and for your needs. So I would suggest body weight exercise is a great way to rebuild your functional strength. And there are some specific functional types of movement patterns like pulling and pushing Mm -hmm. and um, squatting and, and hinging at the hips. And these types of exercises can be done with just your own body weight with simple handheld weights if you Mm -hmm. have them. Um, But I I just think like rebuilding your foundation is a Mm -hmm. really smart way to go and, and to really take it in incremental steps as far as like, uh, all what I call all or something, not, all yes. or nothing. you know, like say you that. were used to training, like you used to train five or six days a week and it's not probably appropriate to go five or six days a week hard. If you're just recovering from COVID, because a lot mm-hmm. of people have long COVID and it really yeah. saps their energy. Or if you've just recovered from a, a, a long-term like autoimmune, mm-hmm. something that attacked your system, like mold, these mm-hmm. things are where you want to kind of pace yourself. I would look into doing more yoga practice to mm-hmm. help, um, really support the parasympathetic system and bring you into like a lowered stress state as well as challenge your body functionally with those types of movement patterns. Also looking into like my body weight programs, which Mm -hmm. are excellent. And I have a functional fitness foundations course that's free. And like these types of things will really help you just get back into a routine and get you back to moving and doing those foundational movement patterns. And you can start adding more resistance or adding a little bit of quick bursts of of explosive Mm -hmm. plyometrics in the mix as you start to rebuild your strength and cardiovascular system. Now, if you are going through a season like perimenopause or menopause, that's a horse of a different color. Mm -hmm. So that specifically what I recommend from my own studies and continuing education in this area, particularly is that this is the time of our lives when it's a little harder to build muscle. And this is why we want to approach things very strategically. Number one, we want to up our protein intake, especially at this time of our lives. And I would recommend that to the other scenarios I I mentioned as well, because the amino acids in protein support not only muscle protein synthesis, but your cognitive function, your hormone and enzyme function, and your immune health. So there are lots of good reasons to be eating your protein uh, with each main meal because your body doesn't have a storage tank for the aminos like it does for carbs and fat. However, it puts them into your muscle tissue. And if you're not eating regular protein with each meal, it will break down your hard earned muscle tissue to get at those aminos. And you don't want that. So I recommend upping your protein intake. And 
um, I really suggest potentially leaning on a whole food, organic, healthy protein powder supplement, um, mm -hmm. like mine, for instance, yeah. shameless plug, because I use these personally and recommend them to my friends and family. And I know they're the best. And I also want to up my protein intake because we stop absorbing our aminos as readily over 40. So there is this like need for that. Mm -hmm. So again, peri and postmenopause, that's my first tip. And my second tip is to really start to think about polarizing your training. So I want you to focus on strength. I want you to focus on progressing through your strength goals. If you're new, you're going to start with a body weight foundation. And just like we talked about, you'll start to up your resistance as you go. And as you're comfortable adding in handheld weights, potentially maybe building all the way up to barbells, but don't go yeah. crazy into some CrossFit class out of nowhere. Cause you could injure yourself. And I really recommend polarization. And the reason I say this is because if you're able to, you, your muscles need a higher stimulus at this stage to respond. Mm -hmm. And so you want to really fully recover and rest them before you get that next workout hard, right? So this is why I really recommend taking your rest days. So you could do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, mm -hmm. hard workout and take a rest day, Tuesday, Thursday. Maybe you do a fun yoga class on the weekend or go hiking or something else. And then you take another rest day, but really, really focusing on having that split. Another split that, that I like is um, a Monday, Tuesday workout, a Wednesday rest day, Thursday, Friday workout, a Saturday rest day, then Sunday, Maybe I'll do some yoga or some core and I'll walk every day because walking mm -hmm. also helps bring us into this sort of more parasympathetic state, gets you outside, helps keep your insulin levels stable after you've eaten. Walking after a meal is a great way to stabilize your blood sugar and help keep body fat at bay if that's something that you're focused on at this stage. And if we really all knew this, just these simple tips, if we just yeah. started implementing these at that life stage, we would see a big change. But we hear a lot of um, fad diets around this time, and, and we hear a lot of things that actually are appropriate for a very specific subset of the population. They've been studied in a medical context, but not really in a fitness context, and they get sort of blown out of proportion and then turn into these marketing things that a lot of us fall prey to. And we may initially experience like a great result with, but they're actually heightening our cortisol levels, which mm -hmm. causes fat storage, breaks down our muscle tissue. They create a lot of inflammation and can cause long-term bone loss in certain people. So I'm talking about fasting in particular. Mm -hmm. And as you are an actual medical doctor who has probably prescribed fasting to a specific group of your patients, I'd love for you to speak about when it's appropriate and when it's not. Yeah, no, I love that we're talking about this and you and I have talked before we think alike because it is such a fad. There's so many things out there of, oh, bone broth for everybody, fasting for everybody. And it just doesn't work for everybody. And it can be detrimental if you're the wrong body type. So a couple bone things. Bone broth though, everybody. Yes, right? Is bone broth good for everybody or no? I didn't, I wouldn't well, know. Well, would high histamine, bone broth is high histamine. So bone uh, broth can be an issue for histamine. So again, it's one of those no. little things. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. Thank you for sharing. So for those, again, I love bone broth, but if you have high histamine, then you have to be careful with that. And it might be just for a season, just like these other things. So yeah. the, the studies with fasting is really good for metabolic diseases. So if someone really has complete insulin resistance, they're fully diabetic. And even in that case, they may need to ease their way into it, but fasting can shift them into a more metabolically flexible state. And what we're talking about is there's many different types of fasting, but typically intermittent fasting is one of the popular fads where people go periods of time, anywhere from 12 to 18 or more hours between their meals. And what you were saying is important because if you have an autoimmune disease, if you've just gotten over COVID, if you're a woman that has any change of hormones, you have low adrenal function, you have hypoglycemia that's reactive and many other things, you're not going to do well in that fast. And it's actually going to be a stressor for your body, or it could raise your cortisol. So you really have to know the type. And then I deal with all kinds of people with autoimmune diseases, with pancreatitis or with pancreatic insufficiency or with blood sugar issues that aren't diabetic, that actually it's so stressful because their body doesn't convert easily to glucose when they're fasting and then their body's starving. They don't do well. So it, it isn't for everybody. And I love that you bring that up. And especially with these hormonal transitions, I think we need to be kind to ourselves perimenopause, menopause, because there's a lot going on. And what we, what I see more often than that now is these people with adrenal, either very low cortisol, they've, you know, burned out their adrenals, they're high stress. And when you have very low cortisol, these high intensity workouts, these fasting things that are again, all the fad, they don't work and they're not good for that type of person. I, 
couldn't agree more just from my experience as mm -hmm. a trainer and coach and seeing people really suffer to lose body fat because they've just burned themselves out. And, you know, we talk about high intensity workouts and we're talking about just overdoing a lot of cardio. I know yeah. Dr. Jill, you've okay. had in the past, mm -hmm. you've overdone the cardio mm -hmm. training. And when you started adding yeah. more strength training in the mix yes. with balanced yeah. cardio, that's, you know, worked in at intervals. Yes then we get really a greater benefit, especially in this age group that we're talking yes. about. Well, yes. you know, like, because we do need the explosive cardio to mm -hmm. a certain extent, like, but it's usually a shorter amount. And that sort of like um, the load that that puts on the joints has a protective benefit because it's like any other resistance load, yeah. just strategically different, gets your heart rate up. And that's a good thing. Um, but we don't want to overdo all these things. And I think that's sort of what I see happen a lot with a lot of both the diets, the yeah. exercise tips. We see people take one nugget of truth and then spread it across yes. like all these yes. other genres. And there's sort of, there's always been this sort of gender bias when it comes to the scientific research yes. that has been done on different diets, because we see mm. that fasting in general seems to work really well for a lot of men. Um, Absolutely. That's the other thing. Men seem to do really well. Most men do really well with fasting women, not as much because we have these and like you said, cycles yeah. too, because any woman who is cycling, there's a difference in your cycle. And there's times when you shouldn't be fasting. There are times when you may do better fasting. Yeah. Um, so it's it's important. If, if it's appropriate for yeah. you in your yeah. particular medical condition Correct. as well. And right. I, I think this is why it's so important to, to talk to someone like Dr. Jill uh, to, to understand um, a little bit deeper about what your unique situation is and really, really see like, why, why is this appropriate or inappropriate for me? I mean, yeah. marketing, marketing messaging, I, I don't demonize marketing. I think that there are so many great companies out there offering such wonderful, valuable products, but there is a choice that you make in the way that you market things to people. And there is a great deal of psychological research done about what people respond to and people mm -hmm. respond best to fear-based marketing. And I remember very early in my career choosing to do something called aspirational marketing. Uh -huh. And um, that was a, a trend that I watched Facebook pick up really quickly in the early days of Facebook advertising. It's just an interesting side note where they started like squashing ads from those old diet giants that would talk about the muffin top or be very shaming. And, and yeah. we picked up the vernacular of those old ads. That's why a lot of us are still stuck on like low fat yes, or yes. sugar because these ad mm. campaigns were so much money was behind them in order to make money to sell mm -hmm. to sell us things that we picked up this perception that our muffin top was bad that we had bat wings these yeah. horrible words yeah. to describe things about our bodies that happen as we go through seasons and and maybe we have the opportunity to reduce our body fat but we don't need to feel shame right. about our body changing it could be in response to an underlying medical condition yeah. or a season in your life you're going through that you're very busy and fitness can't just can't be the priority. Why do we need to feel bad about ourselves when we're prioritizing and doing the absolute best we can in our lives? Yeah. I just, we just yeah. have to remember, we have to step back yeah. and look at the greater cultural context of where we get these messages of perfection from and yeah. that they're damaging and that that narrative is just, there is an example and that we can reinterpret it However yes. We yes. And when you're looking at whether it's television or Netflix or the social media or um, any of these platforms, you're seeing, you're seeing um, filtered and you're seeing versions that aren't even real. And it's so hard to remember that, but it's so important for us to continue to talk about that because so often we see those images and we compare ourselves to them subconsciously and we don't we don't fit in, but what we're comparing ourselves to is something that doesn't even exist. It's not reality. Exactly. So I just love continuing to bring this message out because it, reality is, is, is your, you know, people on the street and you look and see images and that's much more like the, than the whitewash stuff we see in social media. Diversify your yeah. intake. If you yes. can yes. try to find accounts, like if you're interested, yep. I love Instagram. I love the visual mm -hmm. social media yeah. aspect of it, but I mean, I have such a diverse stream of images that I look through throughout the day and diverse perspectives that yeah. really helps me stay more in touch with people around me in the real world, have, exactly. like, have a better perspective on what other people may be experiencing and feeling because I'm not trying to just follow some fitness model right. or some health guru or just someone who seems to know have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers. Correct. Everybody has different things that can be valuable to you, even the things that aren't right for you can be valuable in helping you rule out 
you know, there's no need to be angry or blame anyone for not telling you the perfect answer. And we all are responsible for finding the answers ourselves yeah. and for looking through diverse resources. Yeah. I mean, it's just how we're always. So love that. And um, the last thing, and then I want to talk about just a little bit about food before we wrap up um, sure. is if you are struggling, again, we talked about these situations where you maybe can't move like you used to move, whatever. I always want to just encourage, like you mentioned, Brie, just continuing to move in whatever way you can. And it might be just all you can do is a 10 minute walk a day or a 30 minute walk a day, but Walking. still that, so uh, yeah, because even people who are literally disabled or having struggles with chronic mm -hmm. illness, chronic infection, whatever, and they're always like, can I exercise? Can I do this? I still encourage them to move and whatever way that is, movement is key. And if you can incorporate breath work at the very beginning, if you're starting to, you know, say you've been bed bound or disabled or something like that, or you've been really, really severely ill post COVID or autoimmune, all these things we're mentioning or mold as many people have, you start by moving and you start by getting that body going again. And then anyone can start to do very, very simple body weight stuff. At, on your floor at home. And I would totally encourage you to follow your um, Instagram and your social Brie, because you've got some really great training tips for any, any area you are at, wherever you're at in your fitness training, often you can pick up those things and start to do them. So I love you talking about protein. Um, what does that practically look like? Well, like what might a typical day look like for someone as far as getting enough protein and kind of doing the things, and especially this perimenopausal group we talked about that needs to maintain muscle. Um, what would yeah, that look like? Specifically, I would recommend that you first start by taking a look at how much protein you're eating daily in general. And you can do that yeah. very simply by whatever you're putting on your plate in each meal, just look up how many grams of protein are in the foods that you're eating and start to get a baseline. On average, it's recommended that women under 40 consume 20 to 30 grams of protein per meal. That may be a little low for you. If you're mm -hmm. training or you want to build muscle, you may want to go a little higher. Newer research points to the fact that um, going higher than the old outdated recommendations for protein are quite safe. And um, we just have to get that out of our mind that protein yeah. is somehow needs to be demonized because mm -hmm. it does not. Uh, and there are many great sources of it. You want to be thinking about your complete proteins that have all nine of the essential aminos that your body can't make on its own. So if you're not eating meat, make sure that you're really paying attention and do some research to figure out this stuff because you deserve to know. And then if you're over 40, I recommend on average 30 to 40 grams per meal. And that might seem like a lot to some people, but if you're eating eggs for breakfast, look at how many grams of protein are in your eggs. You're going to have on average six grams of protein per egg. So if you have two eggs for breakfast, that's only 12 grams of protein. Well, you can boost that by adding, you can buy like a carton of egg whites and add more egg whites to the mix, which would be able to boost your protein intake up to maybe like 30 grams. That way you have a little bit more and you keep your, your fat content at a reasonable amount because those yolks are really nourishing for us. So we want to make sure we have them. Another trick that I use a lot is I'll make a protein pancake. So I'll mash a banana, put in two eggs, and then I'll add a scoop of like my organic, I love vanilla protein powder to it, which has 20 grams of protein. So then we add 12 plus 20, that's 32 grams right there in my pancake. And that's delicious. If you're having a protein shake, in the look, check how many grams of protein are in the protein. It might be 20 grams. Do a scoop and a half. Do get mm -hmm. to get it up to 30, or do a double scoop to get it up closer to 40. If you're um, looking for something like that, if you are having a turkey burger patty for lunch, uh, and you have you can control what's in it. You can look up how many grams are in how many ounces, and 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 act accordingly. If you're ordering lunch from a kitchen somewhere, keep in mind that a lot of times protein is the more expensive item in the sandwich that you're getting. So pay the three extra dollars to have them do double the protein on your sandwich, right? That's going to help you feel more full mm -hmm. and satisfied with your meal. You'll be less likely to overeat or crave that cookie after you eat. That's how going to stabilize your sh blood sugar and, and give your brain and body and immune system, all of those aminos that it needs as well. So those are just some of my practical tips for, um, you know, just getting enough protein and in different meals, dinner, same thing, just start to look how many, you know, like last yeah. night I had salmon. And, um, you know, when I buy the salmon, I, I try to make sure I get the right size piece yes. for my needs. And that's all I'm doing. And it's quite simple. Once you've looked it up a couple of times, it's not really that much work to just remember how many ounces you need of different proteins. And, um, remember plants have proteins in them as well. And you can combine them. You just want to make sure you're aware that's a little bit more work, but yeah. you can do it. I mean, it just, just don't be daunted by this stuff. Take care of your 
body. And I'm not just talking, protein is not the only thing you want your fiber dense yeah. complex carbs that are slow digesting. You want your healthy fats. You want to eat plenty of fiber dense fruits and veggies. These things are good. If you ever have somebody telling you fruit is bad, just run in the other direction, unless you have a medical condition and yeah. your doctor is advising you about fruit, just pay attention to the glycemic index of how much sugar they have. I, if I'm having a tropical fruit in a smoothie, I'll only do one tropical fruit and do a berry as my other yep. ingredient so that I'm not like banana and pineapple or banana and my mango, right? Like I'm not putting yeah. all, those are very high sugar fruits, the tropical fruits. And so yep. berry is going to be the lower sugar. So we just combine those things to get sort of that better balance to our, to our fruits, just things to keep in mind. Love it. So much practical information. And one thing that people like to do is salads. Salads can be tricky because they're not a lot of, uh, I mean, there's wonderful um, fiber in that lettuce and the leafy greens if you mix them. But what I love to do is add some protein, nuts and seeds and meats and things on that salad so that you make sure, like you said, you're still getting plenty of, um, because a lot of times if you go out to eat and you're ordering just a lunch salad and it has a few sliced tomatoes, some shredded carrots and that, and you're dressing, you've got sugar and a little bit of uh, fiber, but you don't have enough protein. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and if you're, um, you know, I would, I would get my salad with some complex carbs, like a grain, like a yep. quinoa or some sweet potatoes or some squash or, yeah. you know, something like that along with a protein source for sure. And then, you Excellent. know, a salad is, you know, another way of getting in like extra greens. Right? Yeah. And you can really make them so delicious, but you need to <laughs> load on the goodies on top. Um, awesome. So What's any sort of final parting wisdom for patients who are suffering from, you know, maybe being, feeling stuck. We talked about being kind to yourself. We talked about starting with something, weight training being so critical, getting enough protein, all these really practical things. Any last bits of wisdom, especially for the person who feels stuck in their condition at this moment, we know this will pass. They maybe don't like how their body shape or body composition is. What's the last little bit of uh, wisdom that you might give that person? I want you to picture your best girlfriend or your best friend and um, try to imagine if they were going through what you're going through and they came to you asking for support and advice and what you, what would you say to them? And I want you to imagine how you could say those things to yourself, because just like we talked about being an ally with our bodies, we do have to be our own best ally when we're going through anything. I had a trick that my EMDR therapist helped me do and I'll share it with you. She helped me imagine this best version of myself. And I imagine that she's like sitting right next to me and she puts her arm around me and she says, you can do it. You're great. And she gives me all of those kind words that I often give to others that I care about. And sometimes when I'm struggling in a moment, I like to picture her beside me because you guys, you know yourself better than anyone. And you know what you're, you have a vision of yourself at your best, bring that vision towards yourself, use it as a strength for yourself and, and give yourself the support and love that you so deserve and know that it's just a few more steps. And, and if you can just stay the course and stay patient and love yourself along the way, you will get where you want to go. And it, you're probably going through a very important process that your body needs time to process. Think about computer systems. They they don't all work at lightning speed. They didn't all work at lightning speed in the past. You know, we're, we're not a robot. We're not a machine. We have time that is needed for this, these hardworking cells all dedicated to you to do their processes. So be an ally with yourself, love yourself as you go through these journeys. And as you go through these like stages of life, they're all serving you. They're all valuable lessons and they will help you in the long run. That's what I think. Oh, that is so well said. So well said. I couldn't say it better. And I always say, like you said, be kind to yourself. And it's funny because my I call them oh sweetheart messages. Like, oh sweetheart, you're doing it's like you're talking to yourself. We do that to other people and it's easy, right? But it's so yeah. hard to focus on ourselves and like you're doing a great job. Keep up the great work. We're going to get there. So what a great way to leave our listeners with that message of just being kind to ourselves because our body will respond much better than if we beat ourselves up. Awesome. Thank you for the great advice today. As always, Bree, so fun to connect. Yes. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me and letting me talk with you about all these really so cool fun. topics. And thank you for listening out there. And uh, it was great to get to spend a little time with you all. And of course you, Dr. Jill. Yes. Awesome. Thank you all. We'll look forward to talking to you next time.